second Auden lecture. I was reading last time from uh, uh, poems from the 30s, uh, those love poems, um, uh, Lay Your Sleeping Head, My Love, and um <coughs> uh, This Lunar Beauty. Uh, the, the ballad uh, that I uh, read for you as I walked out one evening, uh, also a poem about love, uh, also comes from the uh, later 30s. Uh, it is collected, though, in this book uh, called Another Time, uh, a book Auden published in uh, 1940. Uh, and I wanted to, um, well, let's see, I'm afraid I've got my order all mixed up here. Um, I wanted to show you uh, what um, just the table of contents of this book, because it's, it has a, a number of masterpieces in it uh, that you are reading. Uh, it's also um, significant that it's organized in the way that it is. Uh, the first section is called, humbly, I guess, or practically, uh, People and Places. Uh, and it includes uh, in it um, the poem I'll be discussing shortly, Musée des Beaux-Arts. Uh, there's um, um, another uh, couple of sections, uh, a section called Lighter Poems. Uh, it includes, um, uh, well, all kinds of um, song forms, uh, refugee blues, uh, different kinds of blues. Uh, and some uh, uh, kind of uh, gothic satirical ballads, uh, Miss G, uh, James Honeyman, uh, uh, poems that are antecedents for a song like uh, Maxwell's Silver Hammer. This is uh, the kind of thing Auden was writing. Uh, and then there's also something else called occasional poems. And in this box, Auden has put Spain 1937, that. Uh, uh, great political poem uh, from the uh, Civil War, uh, <coughs> and uh, these uh, poems that I'll be discussing today, In Memory of W. B. Yeats and In Memory of Sigmund Freud. Uh, I wanted to call attention to this uh, uh, book, first of all, because it, it shows us these poems embedded in the actual context in which they first appeared, uh, but also to point out the way in which Auden uh, has organized his, his book. Uh, he, that is to say, he has um, thought of his poems as belonging to specific categories uh, and, and placed them uh, accordingly. Uh, and they, uh, they have different uh, genres, different forms suitable to different purposes and occasions. And this is very much um, the uh, uh, way in which Auden imagines himself as a poet, I think. Uh, that is, um, someone um, writing with a kind of uh, technical mastery with uh, access to a whole repertoire of traditional forms which are suitable to different purposes and different occasions. Uh, this general perspective on, um, uh, um, on his work uh, is related to uh, the topic that I introduced in uh, discussing as I walked out one evening, and that is the whole question of perspective uh, in Auden. <coughs> uh, you remember I, I talked about how that poem seems to include, well, at least three different uh, perspectives. That is the um, uh, quoted song uh, of the lover uh, who um, tells his beloved that he will uh, love her uh <coughs> uh, until the end of time. Uh, then uh, there's the voice of the clocks who speak from the point of view of time uh, and uh, uh, correct uh, his, his uh, claims. Uh, and then finally, there's a kind of uh, uh, narrative voice that seems to frame the whole thing um, with that image of the river running on. Um <coughs> uh, as in that poem, uh, Auden seems to uh, be able to incorporate in his poetry multiple perspectives, each of which uh, comment on or are framed or conditioned by the others, but each of which uh, has its independent truth, you could say. <coughs> um, this is a, a topic that we'll uh, explore more today, looking at other poems. I wanted to show you some uh, photographs. Um, in, the, in the 1930s, 
during the um, uh, Japanese-Chinese uh, War, uh, prelude to the Second World War, um, Auden uh, went with his friend Christopher Isherwood uh, to China uh, and created uh, a book together called Journey to a War, which includes Isherwood's prose and Auden's uh, poetry. Uh, it's quite a remarkable book. It also includes uh, photographs uh, which are presented in an interesting way. Uh, we have here um, two different photographs of boys. <coughs> uh, boys uh, uh, who are classified here as soldiers and civilians. Uh, and then uh, grimly um, uh, are identified uh, as with legs and without. Uh, there's um, a, a kind of interest in these photographs and in their presentation of how in the ways in which in war uh, who we are is a matter of uh, perspective uh, and point of view. Um, the um, um, war gave uh, Auden and Isherwood uh, an opportunity to um, uh, experience what it is like to be on the ground when uh, planes are overhead um, bombing you. <coughs> um, and and here's, a, here's one uh, uh, photograph uh, of that uh, condition. Uh, and here is, is another uh, uh, illustration of this general <laughs> point I wanted to make. There's, uh, there are unidentified corpses uh, under blankets there. Uh, there are then um, uh, scattered human remains and, and debris. Uh, and the one photograph is uh, identified as the innocent and the other as the guilty. <coughs> Well, <coughs> the great poem uh, on this general theme uh, in Auden's work is uh, Musée des Beaux-Arts. Uh, it is um <coughs> a uh, poem that Auden wrote uh, after returning from China uh, in um, December, uh, I believe, um, 1938, uh, contemplating uh, a uh, return to the United States where he had um, uh, uh, visited um, a short time before, uh, contemplating, in fact, expatriation, also contemplating uh, an imminent war, uh, a world war <coughs> that would uh, extend the uh, horror uh, that he had uh, witnessed in China uh, to all of Europe and beyond. Uh, suffering, in other words, uh, was on his mind, and uh, it's the subject, uh, or rather art's relation to suffering is the subject of this poem. The poem uh, has as its occasion uh, a visit to um <coughs> the Musée des Beaux-Arts in Brussels, uh, where um, Auden saw, among other works, uh, this painting, uh, The Fall of Icarus, um, uh, that uh, uh, is painted by Peter Bruegel. Uh, this and other uh, Bruegels are referred to in um, the course of, uh, of the poem, which proceeds almost as a kind of imaginary gallery tour or walk, uh, in which uh, Auden, uh, as our companion, uh, takes us to uh, different works and contemplates their commentary on the general issue that uh, he is uh, uh, raising here. What is art's relation to suffering? About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position. He's concerned with how you position suffering in human life. And he's taking Bruegel and, and, uh, uh, <coughs> as, a, as a model. Uh, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along, as this line of poetry itself seems to. How, when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth. Now he's contemplating a nativity scene. There must always be children who did not specially want it to happen. 
skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot, the old masters, that even the dreadful martyrdom, and now he's looking at Bruegel's painting, The Massacre of the Innocents, that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life, and the torturer's horse, no more innocent or guilty than those boys, I suppose, scratches its innocent behind on a tree. Uh, the old masters uh, know the human, the human position of suffering, its position in human life. Uh, position is important. It's an important word uh, for Auden here. He's concerned with uh, how experience is placed. Uh, sometimes he calls this geography. Uh, it is a uh, uh, topos, uh, motif, uh, an idea in his poetry that Elizabeth Bishop will take over quite directly from him uh, and develop and make central to her poetry. The idea is that things have meaning in relation to, uh, in their connection with, but also their separation from each other. <coughs> Suffering is part. Uh, but only a part, not the center uh, of human life, uh, a repertoire of actions and conditions and states of being <coughs> that is much larger. Uh, in, uh, um, in Bruegel, <coughs> uh, in uh, his Massacre of the Innocents, I won't try to find it now among my, my slides for you, uh, Auden focuses on the torturer's horse, <coughs> the, uh, uh, the animal uh, that is uh, uh, part of the scene uh, and that, uh, motivated by an itch, scratches uh, its uh, behind uh, while the dreadful martyrdom runs its course. <coughs> uh, in this poem, uh, as in other uh, uh, Auden poems, uh, note the prose rhythms. Uh, the poem does seem to, at times, walk dully along. <coughs> uh, Auden, like Moore, uh, is writing in an expository manner, an essayistic manner. Uh, this is uh, uh, part of the tone of the poem. Uh, Auden is getting into his poetry uh, uh, a kind of neoclassical uh, 18th century uh, uh, aesthetic, uh, uh, an ability to talk about ideas uh, in, in, in poetry uh, in, in uh, again, a discursive, expository manner that includes humor. Uh, and that, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, is observant. Uh, pain, like the tears that I talked about last time that had dried on Auden's pages. Uh, pain is part of the picture, uh, but it is just a part. It's, in a sense, been put aside. Uh, all of this is a, a function of what I'm calling Auden's perspectivism. Uh, any scene borders on other scenes where other people are positioned uh, looking at the same thing differently or not looking at it at all. Uh, and this is uh, one of the uh, uh, themes of the uh, uh, second uh, section of the poem where uh, Auden specifically uh, describes this painting. He says, in Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, uh, and you know, this is a poetry in which the poet <laughs> says, for instance, <laughs> just as uh, um, uh, Moore might have said, however, <coughs> how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. And he's, he's talking about uh, the sh shepherd that, who's looking up to the sky. He's talking uh, about uh, the plowman uh, who uh, has his back turned to uh, um, the fall. Uh, and, and where is it? It's hard probably for you to see, but it's hard to find in any case because this dramatic event that is the center of uh, Bruegel's uh, <coughs> pictures, in fact, these bare legs disappearing into the sea as the uh, uh, overreaching son of Daedalus plunges into the water, uh, not at all uh, in the center of 
the picture. <coughs> How everything turns away, Auden observes, quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. He's not concerned with uh, flying to or beyond the sun. For him, the sun merely shines. It, it uh, 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 helps him cultivate the land. The sun shone of necessity, as it had to, on the white legs disappearing into the green water. The white legs disappearing into the green water. In the expensive, delicate ship, that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. Well, here, uh, Auden wasn't thinking about Hart Crane, <coughs> but he might have been. Uh, it's almost as if this uh, figure has leaped off the back of the boat, <coughs> uh, as Crane did. Uh, he is, however, thinking, I suppose, uh, about Romanticism uh, in general and its ambitions. Uh, here the sun shines as it had to. Uh, what it illuminates are white legs. There's a kind of objectivity in that. There's a kind of naturalism. Uh, it shines on green water. Uh, it's as if from a certain perspective, uh, from the perspective of aesthetic form, these elements of the picture are uh, merely elements of a picture, uh, colors, uh, uh, which have meaning uh, as they are placed in a system of relationships, in a system of perspectives. Well, there's a great deal more to be said about this uh, 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 painting. Um, I think um, one uh, idea that uh, is worth emphasizing uh, is the uh, uh, way in which the plowman, uh, in Auden's account, as in Bruegel's uh, painting, uh, has prominence, uh, has a greater prominence than the uh, uh, heroic, uh, romantic figure plunging into the sea. Uh, the plowman is going about his ordinary daily work, and as he turns these furrows, we are reminded, as Auden surely was reminded, of the uh, ancient classical uh, uh, connection between verse, uh, meaning the turning uh, of, um, in Latin, uh, from one line to another, and the uh, 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 shaping uh, action of the plow that uh, creates these furrows in the earth, um, committing the poet as he identifies with the plowman to a kind of poetry of craft and of the earth <coughs> that involves, in a sense, turning away from uh, disaster. Well, <coughs> uh, this poem uh, was written in Europe. <coughs> uh, it is um, a um, uh, poem that um, Auden um, let me find this picture here, uh, with which Auden, in a sense, turns his back on uh, Europe and, for the moment at least, the uh, uh, imminent world war. He comes to the United States, he emigrates to the United States uh, in January uh, 1939. Um, this um, personal uh, uh, turning point uh, in a poetic career um, uh, comes at a moment when um, uh, the world is about to be split in war. Uh, it also um <coughs> uh, comes uh, at a significant moment in literary history uh, when Yeats dies and Auden recognizes this occasion as, as a moment to uh, celebrate the poet, uh, uh, contemplate uh, the achievement in modern poetry that he represents, Yeats, uh, and uh, in a sense um, um, 
provide a kind of uh, epitaph for um, a poetry now uh, in the past uh, and behind us that positions Auden uh, in the present. Let's look at the, the view of um, uh, Yeats and of Yeats's poetry that emerges here. Uh, the, um, the poem extends the questions of Musée des Beaux-Arts by asking uh, not so much what is art's relation to suffering as what is the place of art in society generally, or poetry in particular. Uh, Auden begins, he disappeared in the dead of winter. The brooks were frozen, the airports almost deserted, and snow disfigured the public statues. The mercury sank in the mouth of the dying day. Oh, all the instruments agree, the day of his death was a dark, cold day. <coughs> uh, there's <coughs> there's a, a, a sense as Auden uh, elaborates these ideas, that um, 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 well, that natural science is here mocking the uh, pathetic fallacy that all nature should mourn when the poet dies uh, and reflect uh, the uh, um, grief of this uh, event. Uh, He's saying, Auden is, it was a cold day and we had instruments to, to measure it and that, that's what it, it was in a, a kind of uh, factual way. <coughs> uh, he continues, <coughs> Auden does, um, uh, now he, Yeats, is scattered among a hundred cities and wholly given over to unfamiliar affections. Uh, the words of a dead man are modified in the guts of the living. Yeats is passed on to us. Uh, and yet, <coughs> to whom is he passed on? What difference does he make? Uh, Auden doesn't want us to f uh, make the mistake to, uh, of thinking that Yeats is too central a figure, that he matters too much. But in the importance and noise of tomorrow, he continues, when the brokers are roaring like beasts on the floor of the bourse, and the poor have the sufferings to which they are fairly accustomed, and each in the cell of himself is almost convinced of his freedom, a few thousand will think of this day as one thinks of a day when one did something slightly unusual. This is, this is a, a attempt to, in some sense, uh, place poetry uh, realistically uh, in culture. Uh, it doesn't matter to the brokers roaring like beasts on the floor of the bourse. Uh, it doesn't matter to the poor who have their su uh, suffering, to which they are fairly accustomed. It matters, well, perhaps to a few thousand people. <coughs> not a negligible number, uh, but not a large one either. There's a kind of uh, modesty uh, in Auden's claims for Yeats for poetry. Uh, you, could, you could contrast Pound at the same time uh, as this poem is being written, uh, broadcasting his ideas on fascist radio. Uh, or you could think about um, uh, Stevens at the same time uh, dreaming up a poem he will call Notes Towards a Supreme Fiction. This is a rather different uh, claim for what poetry uh, might do. <coughs> Uh, it uh, returns to a theme of the wasteland. Somehow uh, the world that Auden um, is describing is one in which we are each imprisoned in the cell of ourselves, <coughs> uh, recalling the, the locked chambers uh, of um, uh, Eliot's poem. <coughs> um, in the second section, Auden moves to address Yeats directly. Uh, now, uh, Yeats is, in a sense, claimed for us uh, his, his difference, uh, the, the uh, Vatic uh, uh, powers of language, the uh, visionary ambition, uh, the uh, occult learning, uh, all of that uh, that would distinguish and separate him from us uh, is um, um, put aside, and uh, what he shares with us uh, is um, emphasized. You were silly like us. 
silly. Your gift survived it all. It had to survive a lot. It had to survive the parish of rich women who doted on him, uh, his own physical decay, himself. Auden says, Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. Now Ireland has her madness and her weather still. You did not affect it. Uh, you did not affect it because you are a man and only a man. In fact, poetry makes nothing happen. This is uh, um, mm, one of the uh, most quoted sentences in modern poetry. Poetry makes nothing happen. Uh, it uh, uh, is almost always quoted, however, out of context. <coughs> it is part of a long sentence. Uh, it, it comes first as a, as a uh, uh, qualification on, on what Yeats, on the difference Yeats has made in the world. <coughs> Auden saying, in a sense, no, you, you haven't made a difference. Uh, for poetry makes nothing happen. Uh, but the poem continues then, the sentence continues. Uh, Auden says, colon, it survives. Poetry makes nothing happen. It survives. Where? It survives in the valley of its saying, where executives would never want to tamper. It flows south from ranches of isolation and the busy griefs raw towns that we believe and die in, it survives a way of happening, a mouth. Poetry <laughs> doesn't make things happen. What it, do, it, it has a different kind of action. It survives. Uh, it lasts. Uh, how does it last? Where does it last? It lasts in the valley of its saying, a kind of imaginary landscape or kind of world that is created through speech here. Uh, the valley of its saying, uh, perhaps a rich place to live, but also uh, uh, a space that evokes a kind of absence or hollow, right? Uh, or a kind of opening, uh, perhaps, um <coughs> or a gap. Uh, as Auden develops this idea, uh, the um, um, uh, poetry becomes what he calls um, a way of happening, a mouth. And then that valley is refigured as a mouth, uh, an open mouth, I'm sure, a, a mouth open uh, where words are coming out, uh, where uh, more words will uh, follow and flow like a kind of river. <coughs> Uh, poetry, in that sense, doesn't make anything happen. It is rather a way of happening. Uh, that is a kind of method or model, a path or discipline, a way. Uh, not a deed, uh, but something more like the symbol of a deed uh, or the figure of a kind of potential action, a nothing that is somehow something, too. Uh, again, uh, I think. Um, uh, an image implying an open mouth, uh, that is, uh, the mouth of a river, the mouth of a poet, uh, through which uh, language flows. Um, then the poem moves into, um, I think, uh, a kind of illustration of the kind of action that poetry engages in. Uh, and that uh, comes with the movement into these ceremonial quatrains uh, in uh, iambic uh, uh, tetrameter, essentially. Is that what it is? Well, uh, uh, it's, it's definitely a tetrameter. Um, the um, uh, rhyme enters. Uh, the prose rhythms uh, of the poem up to now uh, give way to uh, a kind of ceremonial uh, lyric language. Uh, here, uh, poetry is identified with praise and with prayer. Uh, the poem gives us a kind of performative language of human ceremony that uh, honors uh, Yeats, that uh, 
uh, lays him to rest uh, and yet uh, also absorbs and affirms uh, the power of poetry uh, that was um, in him. Earth, receive an honored guest. William Yeats is laid to rest. Let the Irish vessel lie empty of its poetry. <coughs> Auden goes on to uh, uh, describe the um, uh, way that um, time will honor poetry and will honor Yeats, uh, that time uh, will even, he says, Auden does, forgive Yeats for the right-wing politics that uh, uh, Yeats' uh, later career is marked by and that uh, Auden uh, separates himself from and uh, uh, needs to come to terms with in this poem. Uh, he says, uh, time that with this strange excuse pardon Kipling and his views and will pardon Paul Claudel, uh, uh, Kipling for his imperial jingoism, uh, Claudel for his uh, you know, proto-fascist uh, 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 ideas, pardons Yeats also for writing well. <coughs> uh, Auden, looking back on this poem, uh, would ask himself, how could I possibly presume to um, uh, judge Yeats and forgive him <laughs> morally for his politics uh, and uh, struck these uh, uh, condescending lines from his poem? <coughs> so you won't find them in the collected poems, but you will find the powerful lines that uh, proceed from them. In the nightmare of the dark, all the dogs of Europe bark and the living nations wait, each sequestered in its hate. Intellectual disgrace stares from every human face, and the seas of pity lie locked frozen in each eye." What does the poet do in this condition? Follow poet, follow right, to the bottom of the night, Poet descends and descends into night, uh, a night that is a, a, um, this nightmare in which uh, uh, Europe barks, ready to attack itself. With your unconstraining voice, still persuade us to rejoice. With the farming of a verse, and remember the plowman now, as a figure for the poet, make a vineyard of the curse. Sing of human unsuccess in a rapture of distress. In the deserts of the heart, let the healing fountains start. In the prison of his days, teach the free man how to praise. This is what poetry can offer. Uh, these, uh, uh, it can offer a lesson in how to praise. This is not a this is not making something happen uh, politically in the world, perhaps, uh, but it's making something happen in the heart uh, and uh, perhaps within the eye of uh, each of uh, us uh, who uh, look uh, locked and uh, staring with our pity uh, frozen there. <coughs> uh, poetry would, um, uh, would be a kind of uh, farming in the desert of the heart that would um, uh, break open uh, that which is locked there uh, and uh, free feeling. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a powerful uh, and very traditional uh, claim for what poems can do. <coughs> uh, and, uh, you know, in, in talking about the wasteland, I, I stressed uh, the ways in which Eliot sought uh, um, language of, pu of public ritual that might um, uh, join people uh, separated in the cells of themselves. Here, Auden is working through the same ideas and providing a kind of model for how that might work. <coughs> uh, 
let me uh, turn ahead with you to uh, another uh, great poem from this period, uh, in memory of Sigmund Freud. <coughs> uh, Freud uh, is a kind of plowman. Uh, he is uh, another model for the poet, for Auden. Uh, and this poem uh, proposes still uh, other ways to understand uh, poetry's relation to suffering, uh, represented here by Freud's humanistic therapeutic technique. Uh, what sort of hero is Freud? Uh, Auden calls him an important Jew who died in exile. Uh, it's significant uh, that he is called that by uh, Auden uh, at this moment. Uh, if, you, if you look for the figure of the Jew in Garanti and Eliot's uh, early poem, you'll see that uh, the uh, uh, figure is not dignified with the capital J. <coughs> uh, Anti-Semitism is a uh, uh, crisis in Europe, uh, and it's certainly a pervasive current uh, in uh, modern poetry, whether uh, it is actually uh, a theme or motif as it appears in Eliot or Pound, or uh, simply a uh, um, kind of uh, uh, voluble prejudice as you would find it in Williams's letters, uh, anti-Semitism is, is uh, powerful. Uh, and here uh, Auden is identifying himself with Freud as a Jew and as a uh, Jew in exile. <coughs> uh, and uh, it seems as though Freud, in this way, represents a figure for people uh, um, who are, in some sense, extracted from the nation uh, and uh, who are international in their perspective. Uh, and Auden himself is writing in America from uh, a similar point of view. <coughs> um, as in the Yeats elegy, Auden is reluctant to single Freud out when, uh, as he says, death is so common <coughs> and suffering is so common. Uh, but Freud's point of view for Auden uh, is powerful and valuable precisely because it emphasizes the commonplaceness of human suffering, <coughs> uh, its ubiquity. <coughs> Uh, um, he's praised, uh, Freud is, uh, as the poem uh, unfolds, uh, specifically for the ways in which he responds to suffering. Um, his, uh, uh, how, does he, how does he do it? <coughs> well, uh, around line 28 or so on page 804, <coughs> um, Auden says, all that he did was to remember, like the old, and be honest, like children. He wasn't clever at all. He was silly like us. He merely told the unhappy present to recite the past like a poetry lesson, <coughs> till sooner or later it faltered at the line where long ago the accusations had begun and suddenly knew by whom it had been judged how rich life had been, and how silly, there's that word again, and was life forgiven and more humble. Uh, no wonder the ancient cultures of conceit, in his technique of unsettlement, that's what he, Auden calls Freud's therapeutic technique, the talking cure. It's a technique of unsettlement. The ancient cultures of conceit see in it the fall of princes the collapse of their lucrative patterns of frustration. If he had succeeded, Freud, why, the generalized life would become impossible, the monolith of state be broken and prevented the cooperation of avengers. Of course, they called on God, his, Freud's detractors, but he went his way. Like the poet who follows right to the bottom of the night, down among the lost people like Dante, down to the stinking foss where the injured lead the ugly life of the rejected, and showed us what evil is, not as we thought deeds that must be punished, but our lack of faith, 
our dishonest mood of denial, the concupiscence of the oppressor. Auden emphasizes uh, Freud's uh, um, um, literary dimensions. Uh, uh, the talking cure uh, is, is like a poetry lesson. Uh, it it uh, puts faith in speech, <coughs> in the powers of true speech, to uh, correct and reshape and heal human life. Uh, it is a technique of unsettlement that is a threat to princes, all worldly authority, because it questions authority uh, and empowers the individual speaker to take life into his hands. Uh, like Dante or like Pound's Ulysses in Canto I, uh, uh, like the poet uh, in uh, the end of, of uh, the Yeats elegy, uh, Freud in Auden's poem uh, goes down among the lost people, uh, goes into the stinking foss, which is a, a powerful word. It's a word that appears in Canto I, uh, where Ulysses uh, uh, Pounds Ulysses goes to, to seek Tiresias. Uh, Foss, it's an Anglo-Saxon word. Uh, it reaches back in that sense in cultural history uh, to suggest, um, you know, that our, our present mystery, uh, uh, excuse me, our present misery is um, uh, one with, continuous with that of the past. Uh, and yet, History is something here that can be intervened in, in uh, an individual way, through the kind of uh, true speech that uh, Auden celebrates in Freud uh, and that he aspires to in poetry. <coughs> uh, as uh, the elegy builds towards its conclusion, <coughs> Uh, on page uh, 806, <coughs> again the night appears. Uh, Freud would have us remember most of all to be enthusiastic over the night and its lost people, ourselves, not only for the sense of wonder that it alone has to offer, night, the unconscious, but also because it needs our love. For with sad eyes, its delectable creatures look up and beg us dumbly to ask them to follow. That is, all the properties here of the unconscious who, uh, that are identified at the same time uh, with uh, all those who are lost in society uh, and need to be uh, represented uh, and claimed. They are, like Freud, uh, exiles who long for the future that lies in our power, again, a power of speech. Uh, they too would rejoice if allowed to serve enlightenment like him, like Freud, uh, even to bear our cry of Judas as he did, and all must bear who serve it. Uh, Freud here uh, is uh, um, uh, in exile, <coughs> uh, and he brings insight, uh, but he also brings love. Uh, Auden is imagining a kind of general state of homelessness, uh, which Freud's technique of unsettlement uh, isn't meant to redress, but rather to recognize and accept <coughs> and help us adjust to and live in. Uh, Auden's own technique here uh, it is. Um, uh, I, uh, well, his verse form uh, is a simple syllable count, 11 syllables, 11 syllables, 9 syllables, 10. The, uh, the normative 10-syllable line comes last and fourth and gives a kind of resolution to each quatrain. Uh, this uh, simple pattern, again, accommodates and promotes a kind of prose speech, a kind of ordinariness that identifies Freud's work and the poet's work with a kind of ordinary, ongoing work. Uh, and uh, that accommodates rationality <coughs> uh, in a rational voice, uh, as uh, uh, 
uh, Auden will describe Freud's as being, and yet also accommodates feeling at the same time, uh, accommodates love. One rational voice is dumb, Freud's, he's silent. And over a grave, his grave, the household of impulse mourns one dearly loved because he understood how to love our impulses. Sad is Eros, builder of cities, and weeping anarchic Aphrodite. Uh, it's uh, 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 eventually a, uh, <laughs> a uh, uh, powerful, uh, uh, moving uh, conclusion. Uh, Eros and Aphrodite have lost their champion. I'm going to uh, conclude uh, by uh, commenting very quickly, since we're almost out of time, um, uh, on one last poem, uh, arguably Auden's uh, greatest, uh, In Praise of Limestone, <coughs> a poem written from the perspective of the post-war uh, in the United States, uh, but uh, about um, a kind of imaginary landscape that combines elements of uh, his childhood uh, landscape in northern England uh, and the uh, Italian landscape uh, where uh, he returned uh, in the post-war period uh, and um, um, uh, became increasingly uh, attached to. Uh, it is a kind of uh, allegorical uh, space. <coughs> uh, and it represents a kind of home, I suppose, for uh, the homeless, for uh, uh, we, the inconstant ones, <coughs> uh, as he describes us. Uh, it is this limestone uh, landscape, something to be praised, and it is a poem of praise. Uh, it is um, uh, an image of the world <coughs> without another transcendental world beyond or behind it. Uh, to be in the world, as described in this poem, uh, is to be uh, in an entirely earthly realm. Uh, and again, you might think of the plowman uh, turning away from uh, the uh, uh, overreacher uh, who tried to uh, fly to the sky and, and turns, rather, to uh, the earth. Uh, it is uh, a landscape like that of Stevens in Sunday Morning. Uh, it is uh, uh, a landscape um, that Auden can only uh, describe as a kind of imaginary place, uh, as a, uh, through counterfactual uh, statements. Uh, it is, uh, uh, well, uh, porous, it's rich, it's fertile, uh, it's moderate. Uh, it is not a place of extremes. And uh, hermits and Caesars, they don't belong here. They go elsewhere. Uh, it, it's rather uh, a, uh, uh, a place in which ordinary life and ordinary people uh, might live. <coughs> uh, the very end of uh, the poem uh, is extremely powerful because it looks towards a kind of um, redeemed human life, sees it in this <coughs> landscape, uh, and yet represents it uh, in the conditional. <coughs> uh, Auden says, uh, insofar as, this is on 808, insofar as we have to look forward to death as a fact, something he will never let us forget, no doubt we are right. But if sins can be forgiven, if bodies rise from the dead, and you note the conditional in both phrases, these modifications of matter into innocent athletes, the people that he peoples this landscape with, and gesticulating fountains made solely for pleasure, make a further point. The blessed will not care what angle they are regarded from having nothing to hide. Dear, and now he speaks to a beloved. Dear, I know nothing of either what, <coughs> uh, what that is, what it would mean to be blessed or to have nothing to hide. I know nothing of either of those things, but 
when I try to imagine a faultless love or the life to come, what I hear is the murmur of underground streams. What I see is a limestone landscape, uh, a landscape that is Auden's version of an earthly paradise. Uh, our only image of these ultimate uh, uh, promises. Uh, Auden manages somehow here to uh, make us see and feel what uh, the life to come might be like, what it might be like to be blessed while uh, still acknowledging that we can only live in and be in and speak in uh, the world before us, uh, which is the one that Auden remains throughout his poetry dedicated to. Well, uh, we'll go on to uh, a poet closely uh, <coughs> identified with Auden, uh, Elizabeth Bishop, on Wednesday.